Hi, today is June 30th. We're walking through the Bible, answering the questions, Who am I? Who is God? And what the heck are we doing together? We're reading the One Year Bible, the New Living Translation. So I want to remind you that you have identity because Christ, um, you were created in God's image. You have value because Christ died for you and our relationship is all through our reading. And we are going to refer to 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 1. Chapter 18, verse 12, Acts chapter 20, 1 through 38, Psalm 148, 1 through 14, Proverbs 18, 6 through 7. I encourage you to read it for yourself because there is so much. I cannot read it in the short time that we have together um, because there's just so much. So I would love to hear what God has revealed to you and illuminated in the scripture everybody can read it and there is just a, a different part that gets highlighted and um, it's kind of like the light shines and the lord speaks to us in different ways based on the same truth the same word so we are uh, looking at second kings chapter 17 1 through chapter 18 12 we're talking about the kings of israel None of the kings were good. None of them worshiped God with a hundred percent of their heart. None of them even worshiped God with half a heart. They worshiped idols and they were evil in God's sight. Judah's kings, on the other hand, some were good, some were bad, some were evil, and some were half good, some were all good. And we're going to learn more about that today. So there were different different kings in Israel. I'm not going to take time to uh, to talk about them all, but Israel is at the end of uh, the existence as they know it in the Old Testament because they were so evil that God decided to have Assyria, the nation of Assyria, invade them. And they were very evil people and they were very cruel. What they did was besiege uh, the land, the city of Samaria, and Samaria fell, and the people of Israel were exiled to Assyria. So what would happen was Assyria, the nation, would come in, conquer a people, and take them and mix them up in all of the nations and all of the lands that they had conquered, and then they would bring foreigners and and plant them in the, the land that they had just conquered, the nation that they had just conquered, so that they would not be unified. They, there wouldn't be a unity. And that's what they did to Israel. And uh, then what happened was the foreign settlers did not worship God in his land, and the Lord sent lions among them, which killed some of them. And that's in verse 25, chapter 17. And then uh, what happened was the report came to the king of Assyria and they said, hey, we don't know how to worship this God. And this God is sending lions and killing people. So the king of Assyria sent back a priest that knew how to worship God. So then they started worshiping God and their idols. And there was a mixture of the holy and the profane, which is so, so confusing and so evil and they continued to follow their former practices instead of truly worshiping the Lord and obeying the decrees regulations instructions and commands that he gave the descendants of Jacob whose name he changed to Israel the Lord had made a covenant with the descendants of Jacob and commanded them do not worship any other gods or bow before them or serve them or offer sacrifices to them, but worship only the Lord who brought you out of Egypt with great strength and a powerful arm. Bow down to him alone and offer sacrifices only to him. Be careful at all times to obey the decrees, regulations, instructions, and commands that he wrote for you. You must not worship other gods. Do not forget the covenant I made with you. And do not worship other gods. You must worship only the Lord your God. He is the one who will rescue you from all your enemies. And this is a sad, sad commentary. But the people would not listen 
and continued to follow their former practices. And this is one reason why the Lord had them uh, had them lose their land. Now we go to, in chapter 18 to Hezekiah, son of Ahaz. He began to rule in Judah. And what he did was pleasing in the Lord's sight. Just as his ancestor David had done, he removed the pagan shrines, smashed the sacred pillars, and cut down the Asherah poles. He broke up the bronze serpent that Moses had made because the people of Israel had been offering sacrifices to it. He did not consider the value of these great uh, shrines. He knew that it was worthless because it was leading the people of Israel away from the Lord God. Hezekiah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. There was no one like him among all the kings of Judah, either before or after his time. And he remained faithful to the Lord in everything. He carefully obeyed all the commands the Lord had given Moses. That's in verse 6 of chapter 18. And 7 says, So the Lord was with him, and Hezekiah was successful in everything that he did. So we want to jump to Acts 20, 1 through 38. And Paul is still in, is still uh, traveling around, and he's teaching the believers, and he's, he's talking about Jesus. Now, on the first day, this is verse 7 of chapter 20, on the first day of the week, we gathered with the local believers to share in the Lord's Supper. Paul was preaching to them, and since he was leaving the next day, he kept talking until midnight. The upstairs room where, where we met was lighted with many flickering lamps, and as Paul spoke on and on, a young man named Eutychus, sitting on the window, still, the window sill became very drowsy. Finally, he fell sound asleep and dropped three stories to his death below. Paul went down, bent over him, and took him into his arms. Don't worry, he said, he's alive. And then they went back upstairs and continued their meeting. Paul continued to talk to them until dawn, and then he left. Meanwhile, the young man was taken home unhurt, and everyone was greatly relieved. Can you imagine if you were in church, and it was the third story, and somebody's sitting in a window on the windowsill just fell out, and the preacher just went out and said, oh, don't worry, he's okay. It's unimaginable. But this is what God's power has done in um, in our past history, our church history. And this is what the testimony is regarding Paul. Now, Paul is getting messages everywhere he turns, everywhere he visits, that he is going to have to endure trials. And he is going to have his life threatened. And he said, my life is worthless to me unless... I use it for finishing the work assigned me by the Lord Jesus, the work of telling others the good news about the wonderful grace of God. So this is, he gives a kind of like a last word sermon. He's not going to see these people again. And verse 32, and now I entrust you to God and the message of his grace that is able to build you up and give you an inheritance with all those he has set apart for himself. This would be a good one for mamas to memorize. I entrust you, your, ch your children, to God and the message of his grace. Lord, breathe life into the word uh, that our children have heard and, and plant it in hearts and help it to grow. And you said that your word would not return void. So maybe our words weren't life-giving. Maybe our words weren't encouraging. There were times that we succumbed to the flesh, but God's word will never return to him void. It will do what it, what he purposed for it to do. And the Holy Spirit can stir up the word of God and uh, bring it back with grace and power and skill to those children that you entrust to the Lord. So don't fear. Be like Paul. Don't worry. They're not dead. They're not spiritually dead they are going to be okay. And then he said, I have been a constant example of how you can help those in need by working hard. You should remember the words of the Lord Jesus. 
it is more blessed to give than to receive. And I've always quoted this and said, do you know why? Because it's so humbling to receive. But that's the position that God has given us because he has so much to give us. And if we're not willing to receive, it's very, very difficult uh, for us to get to get what God has for us. And so um, we'll go without. Psalm 148, 1 through 14 is a powerful, powerful psalm. And I want to talk to you a little bit about creation before I start uh, telling you about the psalm. I want to encourage you to study about creation and overcome the lie of evolution. We hear that propaganda over and over and over again everywhere. And the, the lie of evolution as being the source of life is, is a, an attack on the foundation of everything we believe in the Bible. Genesis 1 talks about a young earth. And why does, it, why does believing in creation matter? It's the foundation of who God is. He's creator. It's the foundation of who we are. We were created in his image. And it's the foundation of our relationship. If he isn't creator, then what is our relationship? And Psalm 148 says, praise the Lord. I looked up praise. It says, hallelujah, hallelujah, or shine the spotlight. Hallelujah, shine the light, shine that spotlight. My son is an expert, Alex Gray, and he has like black and white with gray. He has an amazing videos and he talks about and shows flashlights that have incredible power. Our God, we want to, we want to shine the flashlight of our pray with our praise on what God has done. The heavens shine, shine like a flashlight and praise the Lord. And we praise and the skies, praise the Lord. The angels praise the Lord. The armies of heaven, praise the Lord. The sun and the moon, praise the Lord. Let everything that has been created give praise to the Lord for he issued his command and they came into being. He's a creator and creation is his artwork. When you look, just say, God, you're amazing. What masterpiece. And uh, God, his name is great. And then Proverbs 18, fool's words get them into constant quarrels. They're asking for a beating. The mouths of fools are their ruin. They trap themselves with their lips. Matthew 12, 37, Jesus said, by your words, you are condemned or justified. So be careful what you say. I want you to share these videos so God's word may be heard and have an absolutely blessed day.